now we're going to look at bug tracking tool how to write a bug i wanted to show you guys hands-on how to write a bug or create a defect we're going to look into jira bug tracking tool so i'm going to search for jira free trial so this is the official jira site as you can see it says start with a free seven day trial i'm going to click on it so here they have two options cloud and self-managed we're not gonna go with the self-managed one we just want cloud one so we don't have to maintain anything so it seems like they have a new feature which is called if you have less than 10 user it's free so which is awesome so i highly recommend you to go get one or create an account so that way you can play around how many users do you have i would say five and i'm going to choose a free one so you can look at the different options they have but again i don't i don't want you guys to spend money on it unless you're really working on a project you know so here limit is 10 users i mean it has some limitations but it should be good for us at least what are you what we are trying to do so i'm going to click on get started some reason my internet is very slow so you can sign up with your google or gmail accounts or you can sign up with your email so i'm going to actually go with uh, gmail enter your password and it is asking me for permission so i'm going to pre uh, verify your email address and your name and then create your accounts it's taking some time it's setting up my account meanwhile let me so here choose uh, something familiar like your team or company i'm going to say cloud automation cloud automation usa so just give a name click on continue welcome to jira software i'm going to skip it for now skip it so here you can invite your team so i'm going to skip it for now as well if you are new to jira select i'm new to jira for me i'm experienced with jira my team is so if you are new just select new i'm going to select experienced we spend our time working on fixing bugs so i'm going to select that we have i'll select tight because i'm going to you can skip it but i'm going to say next so what kind of board do you want to create i'm going to go over different testing methodologies but for now think about kanban is a flavor of agile and scrum is a flavor of agile so what is the difference i'll go in depth but for now think of both are under agile kanban is a little bit flexible scrum is more you know a process oriented uh, so i'm going to select scrum because there's a really huge demand for people who are really familiar with scrum create a project so i'm going to say cloud demo and there's a key there there's a template i'm just going to go with the default template and click on create so here i have my board right i will go over in detail when i talk about scrum methodology so here we are interested in just create an issue so i'm going to click here issues are actually just click on top of the page create and here so how to create a issue so project so let's say if your company if you have multiple projects it will show up here but for us it's just only one so it should be selected by default but if not you can select it from here so that's a must if you see the red asterisk there that's a that's a compulsory so you have to select it uh, issue type story it's not a story i'll explain the difference between story task bug epic when i talk about uh, different methodologies for so we are creating a bug but the purpose of this tutorial is to just kind of walk you guys through how to create a bug the summary so what is the issue what issue do, do we want to create so actually let's uh, go back to qa doctors so this is a very big issue right the site is not working so we'll actually create an issue for this so i'm here summary we can say qa doctors side is down so then we have description section right so all these the fields you see 
Uh, it varies by company. You can also customize it, but at least we will have to fill in the required fields. So for, uh, in descriptions, uh, we'll need to add more details, meaning here I'm just saying QA doctor site is down or it's not working. Here I can say QA doc doctor website is not working. I am getting, what's the error I'm saying? 500 error. You can copy the whole thing or you can just get this. At least something, we need to add more details. So when you're writing an issue, what are the best practices? You have to add as much as detail you can. So that way developers, you know, they will be able to look into the issue because at the end of the day, they need to fix it, right? So more detail you provide, it'll be easy for them to find the issue. Otherwise, they will have to actually figure out the issue and then solve the issue and then send you a fix. So just to save time, uh, good testers always add screenshots, video, video screenshots, whatever the tools or resources available, you try to add it there. I'm getting following error when I enter, when I go to the website. Then we'll paste in the quotation you just paste in here. And then reported by reporter. So this is if you're working in a, if you have multiple team members, your name will show up here so it is reported by me then you have the priority right so this is very important so this is highest priority how do you know many companies you know the project manager or uh, someone from product or QA lead they will set up the priority but in this case we know this is the highest priority because the site is not working labels if you want to add some labels labels is we'll skip it for now it's more of you know you can label it meaning what module is it right environment this is not requirement required but i would like to add it again it comes back to providing as much detail we can provide the environment i'm using mac os so another thing i need to grab about this mac i need to give them the version so that way they know because every os they have different versions so it will be difficult for them so i'm going to actually take it to my other screen it's not letting me copy it, so I'm going to kind of type it. Mac Catalina version 10, 15. That way, the developers, they're not going to come back to you and saying, okay, what, what operating system are you using? Or if you're using Mac or Windows, what version of the operating system are you using? Then uh, I'm going to, I'm using Safari, so I'm going to say Safari, Safari browser. If you want to, you can also give the version of the Safari. Uh, that's 13.1.1. Safari version 13.1.1. Then here, this is very important. Always try to provide as much details and a screenshot. If you if it's if you can, uh, if it's really hard to reproduce, try to take a video screenshot and go from there. So I have this uh, tool called lighthouse i believe light shot screenshot uh, there are many more perhaps i'll create another video on how to install different screenshot tools so i'm going to click on take a screenshot then i'm just going to actually take everything here save this folder here i'm going to say qa doc so 500 error but i'm going to say safari max safari i'm just naming it according to the platform so that way it'll be easy for me think about i'm testing all day and then you have 20 30 screenshots it'll be difficult for you to find it so i'm just going to say browse here or you can just actually open the folder where you have this and then go from there but for us here here you go insert one file it is added a link linked issues so if we have another issue similar to this we can link it but we don't have any so then we go back to issues here nothing assign assignee so right now we'll leave it to assignee to default or automatic usually project manager or scrum master or lead someone from some one of the leads they will assign it to developers epic link we don't have epic link sprint link we don't have it yet i'll go in details when I talk about Agile and Scrum methodologies. So I'm just going to quickly review here. I think it looks good. Uh, we actually in descriptions, 
I know I forgot to mention one thing. We need to always add steps to reproduce, which basically means how can anyone reproduce the issue? First, so I'm going to say go to www.qadoctors.com. Then they will see the issue, right? But this is kind of straightforward, but in some cases, it'll be you will need to kind of lay out all the details. Let's say if the issue is difficult to find or you know cannot reproduce it all the time or you might need five seven steps to actually go to reproduce the issue or find the issue then it is always helpful to give all the details so some of your team members even your scrum master or project manager or some of the leads you know they can look look into it so they don't have to ping you or say hey how, how did you find the issue you know can you can you walk over so if you have it here it should be self you know explanatory so i'm going to click on create and the issue is created so if you click on this okay not going to so i'm going to go to backlog so if you go to backlog there's the issue here so as you can see all the details are here and our screenshot is here so that's pretty cool this will help you guys to kind of play around so just to summarize this section, I think this section is very important because for QAs, right, writing bug and reporting bug is like one of the main duties because we find issues, then we need to report it. Here, we can add more details like on description section, this particular issue was kind of straightforward because the site is not working. In a, another video, I'll try to go through a complex issue where you know you have to take multiple steps you might have to test it on different browsers perhaps it's working on safari then it doesn't work on firefox or you know it's working on websites but it doesn't work on the apps or some of the devices and uh, how to go about it so idea is same you know we'll just create different issues and then this is also a very good interview question they will ask you what do you add when you create a bug so if you play around a few times this answer should be pretty easy to answer right so first to create an issue you go select your project then you select the issue type then you add a summary then you add description in description you try to provide as much details you can and then you also add steps to reproduce instructions then you add who reported it reporter and then you add priority and which in what environment you found the issue then you add uh, screenshots and then you create so as, if you can say all some of these points that's good enough there are various other tools in the market so jira is one of them you can also use alm this is very famous then there is a trello then there is a whole bunch of other bug tracking tool but jira is really gaining momentum and it's really easy to use i personally have worked with jira on many projects for many years and it's, it's pretty simple and uh, jira has other products it's kind of complements like confluence you know uh, so it kind of works together integration is easy there are a few other famous one now is uh, test rail and uh, linkit but the idea is same right the process is almost similar you when you create you add all these details what i mentioned it to you and uh, try to add as much detail you can all right that's it for this topic testing methodologies are way of managing the project starting from when you have a requirement then all the way it being delivered to the client goes to production and then you know servicing or maintenance in the application so that includes resource allocation developing the software testing it and all these phases that's testing methodology so there are different methodologies out there agile methodology it is a process for managing projects by iteration and collaboration what that means a team can manage a project by breaking them into smaller stages the end goal is to deliver what the client wants or define requirements agile methodology focuses on collaboration between self organizing cross functional teams that way teams can deliver products faster with better 
predictability. Agile method is built to adapt constant changes to the requirements. Here is an example. Product owner writes the requirements. It is sent to the entire team, dev, QA, design team, and so on. Developers, they start writing their code. QA tester, they start writing their test cases. When developers are finished with their code, they will send it to QA. QA will test it. If something fails, it will be sent back to developers. They will fix it. Then it will be retested. Regression testing is done. When everything is completed, the software will be deployed to UAT. Then business owner or product owner will test it. If they are satisfied, then it will go to production. Now moving on to Scrum. What is Scrum? Scrum is a flavor of Agile. Think it as of your favorite candy. Mine is KitKat. KitKat has many flavors chocolate, apple, strawberry. There is even a weird one, purple sweet potato. KitKat also comes in different sizes. So Agile is an overall framework, or you can say Agile sets certain standards. From there, you can use different flavors of Agile, such as Scrum, Kanban, XP, and set rules based on your team's needs. Now, here are the main concepts of Scrum. Remember three threes. First, threes, roles. There are different roles. First one is Scrum Master, then Product Owner, and the team. Let me break it down for you. Scrum Master is similar to Project Manager. Scrum Master is responsible for making the process run smoothly. He or she is responsible for addressing any issues, concerns, which might impact productivity and organizes meetings. They keep up to date every stakeholder or team members with the team's progress. Now going to product owner. Product owner is similar to BA, but product owner owns more responsibilities. Product owner owns the requirements, or you can think of they're the keeper of the requirements. Product owner is a bridge between the team and the customer. Any question team has related to requirements, product owner clarifies it. Main concept for product requirements. If the product owner is not sure about something, they will reach out to the customer or client and update the team. Product owner works very closely with the entire team, maintains product backlog, so you can think it as customer's wish list. Or another way of thinking it as what the customer wants in their product or the features they want, and that is stored in a backlog known as user stories, a feature the customer wants in their application or software. Product owner clarifies questions related to features and bug fixes, sets the schedule for releasing completed work to customers, makes the final call. Usually when testers complete testing a story, the product owner verifies it before moving it to stage or prod. Now the Scrum team. The team is self-organizing and cross-functional group of people. Everyone in the group is part of the team. Developers, keyways, design team, even the Scrum master and the product owner. Team have the authority to make decisions and how to perform the work. For example, break work into tasks. The team size should be small, recommended seven to nine people, but usually that's not the case. Now, second threes, daily stand-ups. Team talks about three things. What did you do yesterday? What are you going to do today? Any roadblocks? What did you do yesterday? Meaning, what work did you do? What for developers, which ticket they worked on? For keyways, what ticket they have worked on? And what are you going to do today? Same analogy. What ticket or user story you're going to work on? Any roadblocks, meaning if, if there's something you need, if, there, if you need some clarifications from the product owner or from anyone, or something is not working, or you need some kind of password or some kind of tools, having, you're having issue with certain tool, you need to resolve that. So you raise the, any kind of issues you're having in standups, and that should be resolved uh, immediately. Another thing to note, daily stand-ups should not be more than 15 minutes. That's for entire team. So if there are 9, 10 people, the max time is 15 minutes. So one should not just give so much detail that you know they are taking the longest time. It should be brief, just giving status. Okay, I have worked on this ticket. For example, as a QA, okay, I have worked on these user stories and move on. Now, the 
third three is spring retrospective meeting or retro meeting it's really difficult to say i have a hard time saying it so i'm going to just refer it as retro meeting retros are done end of the sprint more of a sprint review meeting you can think of it is an opportunity for the scrum team to inspect itself and make plans for improvements three things discussed in the retro meeting what worked well in the sprint what did not work well in the sprint what can be improved in the next sprint it doesn't have to be these three questions or just specifically three questions but that's what i have seen previously other scrum concepts backlog backlog is the wish list as i explained before the features product owner or the business owner once in their application or software user story user stories are requirements viewpoint from the end user meaning that login page right what do you want in login page and there will be detailed description of it should be very detailed so developers can understand design team can design it user story should have all the requirements in details meaning developers will write their code based on it design team will implement their design qa team will test based on the requirement so user story is very important velocity velocity is the amount of work a team can handle in a set period of time here i'm referring to the sprint so two weeks one sprint is two weeks so it how much work can a team handle within two weeks velocity chart velocity chart is a visual representation of your project's progress so it is basically a visual representation sprint small or short milestone sprint is a set of period of time where all the work is done as i explained before sprints can be two weeks three weeks or four weeks i even heard one week sprint burn down chart burn down chart indicates the process of the project in a line graph versus time demo demo is basically where team showcase their work so now we know what is the backlog but how do we know what to work on that's where backlog grooming or refinement meeting comes in it is a recording meeting meaning every sprint will have grooming meeting primary purpose is to make sure there are enough work or user stories for the team to work on before sprint planning so product owner prioritize the backlog items and discuss the stories with the team and answers any questions related to the user stories in this meeting team breaks down large user stories into smaller tasks there are various methods to break down stories some teams use t-shirt sizing or playing poker here i'm going to talk about t-shirt sizing the t-shirt sizing method allows the team to give the product owner a wild guess of how large a tax may be let's say product owner has 10 stories in their backlog t-shirt sizing kind of gives an idea how big these tasks are there are various ways t-shirt sizing can be implemented to keep it simple we can have them as small medium large and extra large and there is this thing called an epic epic is simply too large if a task is a small such as minor changes you can give it a small size small size usually less than four hours of work medium size one to two days of work large size three to four days of work extra large one week or more t-shirt sizing can vary from one team to another or from one company to another now who can t-shirt size people who are going to work on the stories so everyone should be in this meeting the entire team including product owner scrum master matter of fact scrum master who is driving the whole grooming session now we're going to look at sprint planning sprint planning is another meeting before the start of a sprint this meeting officially kicks of the sprint this meeting usually happens after the grooming or refinement meeting the purpose of sprint planning is to define what can be delivered in the sprint and how that work will be achieved sprint planning is done in collaboration with the whole scrum team the team will take the stories from the backlog grooming meeting and estimate them in hours or points remember one thing in grooming meeting the team does not estimate stories refinement meeting grooming meeting is to break down the stories into smaller tasks sprint planning is to estimate them in hours or points 
QAs also give their estimates on how long it will take to test their stories. If you never did sprint planning before, you can follow this general rule. Give half of the time for testing versus dev's time. Example, if a dev gave 5 hours for his or her story, for testing you can give about 2.5 hours. Sprint planning should not be more than 2 hours. This can be done by time boxing. The Scrum Master is responsible for making sure the meeting happens as the time box is understood. If the team is happy before the time box is finished, then the event is over. A time box is a maximum time allowed. There is no minimum time allowed. I know Scrum is not easy to understand. Only way to fully understand is by involving yourself with the Scrum process. Here I'm going to give you guys an example from one of the companies I work. Not every company or project follows the same rule. I'm sharing this for your better understanding. We follow two week sprint. Sprint is nothing but a time period. The team has two weeks. Stories picked up by the team should be completed by that time. For any reason, if they cannot finish all the tickets or user stories, those remaining tickets can roll into the next sprint. I am used to saying grooming meetings. The entire team should be in the meeting, including product owner and scrum master. Scrum master is kind of the moderator or organizer of the meeting. The product owner sets priorities from the backlog for the sprint. It is a good idea to groom the backlog items for few sprints, but sometimes for time constraints, that's not possible. Developers, architects, QAs can ask questions if they need any clarification. Most of the questions are asked by devs since they are going to work on it and have technical knowledge. Product owner clarifies any questions or concerns the team might have. We use version 1 for project management tool. You can use Jira as well. Scrum Master usually pulls the backlog items and the team t-shirt size them. We categorized large stories that needed more than one sprint to complete as epic. Now if I ask you what is an epic, you should be able to answer, right? And I just said one sprint. How many days is that? That's your homework. Leave your answer in the comments section below. Most companies I have worked use two weeks sprint, but that doesn't mean that every company must use two weeks sprint. Some companies use three weeks sprint as well. If developers thought a story needed less than four hours to complete, that's a small. If a user story estimated about one to two days, that's a medium. Anything estimated more than two weeks for one sprint, that is an epic. So what do you do with an epic? You break them into smaller stories. So it's not an epic anymore. It can be two or three user stories if needed. Grooming session should not be more than two hours, but it can be less. Usually the next day, the entire team meet again for another meeting, but this time it is sprint planning. Sprint officially starts by kicking off or starting sprint planning. Product owner is optional to join since in this meeting, the team is going to estimate their work by hours or points. Having product owner in the meeting can cause conflicts unless there are trust between product owner and the team members. For some tickets, no one knows how long it's going to take them to complete. Everyone should use their best judgment. Moving on with the topic, Scrum Master pulls up the user stories that were groomed in grooming meeting previous day. Now for each story, they give their estimate. QAs also give their estimate. Let's say we have a user story called login page. We have three devs in the meeting, one QA and Scrum Master. Dev one takes this particular login page ticket. Scrum Master asks him, what is your estimate? He says 10 hours. That's two days worth of work. How is that calculated? One day is eight hours, right? There are meetings and so on. So three hours allocated for meetings and other activities and five hours for real work. Let's put it that way. For the same ticket, Scrum Master will ask QA to give her estimate. She might say five hours since she needs to test across multiple platforms, browsers, and devices. The same process will be done for every single user story until the team finished with estimating all the tickets or they reaches the two hour mark. One point to remember, Scrum Master and Product Owner should not give any estimates. The next step is the actual work is being done. The entire team will work on their assigned 
tickets. End of the sprint, team will meet again to showcase their work, also known as demo. You can say it's another meeting where team members will demo their work and anyone can ask questions or put their input. Last thing is the retro meeting. I have already covered that part and that's the whole flow. Hope that gives you better understanding of Scrum. Why Scrum or why is Scrum so popular? Following the Scrum methodology, team can ship code faster or deliver code to production faster. Work is done in a very organized manner. Everyone knows their role, what tasks to complete. Any questions answered in a faster manner, it saves money, it reduces failure, increases predictability. Besides Scrum, within Agile, there are few other flavors, such as Kanban and XP. So Kanban, you can think it of as more flexible. Scrum has certain rules you need to follow. Kanban is flexible in that sense. I have seen in many projects, we using the Kanban methodology, teams have taken some of the concept of Scrum, but not following all the way. For example, there are no grooming meetings. Team simply goes to sprint planning and that's it. And there might not be any demo. And XP, XP also is known as extreme programming. What is a waterfall methodology? The waterfall method is a linear sequential project management approach. Each phase depends on the deliverables of the previous one. To simplify this, if you look at the chart I have down there, in first phase, requirements are finalized. When it's finalized, it goes to design and you cannot add any more requirements. It's finalized, it's moved into the design team or it was sent to the design team designers, they will design and then that will be sent to the development team, QA team, other teams. Developers, they will start writing their code, QA, they will start their developing their test one, test cases and so on. When they have completed writing all the code they will send it to qa and qa will test it and when everything is fixed it will go to uat the business owner or the client if they're satisfied then it will go to production and then it will go for maintenance and if you need to add in new features it will go through the same cycle again so that's the difference between agile and waterfall agile is flexible api what is api API stands for Application Programming Interface. API enables communication and data exchange between multiple software systems. It defines the kinds of calls or requests that can be made, how to make them, the data formats that should be used. Companies build APIs for their customers or for their internal use. API is another confusing topic. Let me try to give you some examples so you can understand. API is becoming a crucial part of software development because it reduces bugs. When you type ufill.com on your browser, a request or a message goes to ufill server. Once your browser receives a response or reply back, it translates the code and displays the page. There are many companies just selling APIs. There are also many open source free APIs. The Animal Shelter Manager is an open source software product for managing an animal shelter. The Animal Shelter Manager API integrates data about animals, shelter adoption and care. It is targeted at animal shelters, rescue groups and animal control facilities. The API can return animal images, thumbnails and animal adaptable views. If you want to build a similar service, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You can just use their API and it's free to use. Another way to think of it is that a bunch of services or operations are bundled in a package and it's ready for use. Let's look at Gmail login API. Same API can be implemented for Google, YouTube. Same API can be exposed with third parties such as many sites allow you to sign in with your Gmail credentials example udemy types of apis apis can be written and used for various systems or applications our focus is web-based applications but there are few other use cases web-based applications computer hardware computer operating systems database systems 
Now, as a QA, what do you need to know about API? By now, you should know about functional and non-functional testing. API testing is a bit different. There is no GUI to test, no look and feel. You use software to send calls to the API and get an output as a response. Now back to our main topic, web services. Web services communicate between applications over a network, usually HTTP or HTTPS. All web services are APIs, but not all APIs are web services. However, a API does not need a network. You can think web services are a subset of API. There are different web services API types, such as SOAP, REST, etc. SOAP stands for Simple Object Access Protocol. REST, Representational State Transfer. SOAP is an Older API type and most companies are now using REST. I will focus on RESTful API. What is REST API? REST or RESTful API kinda took over the market. It is much easier to use and maintain. REST uses architectural style. It permits different data formats such as HTML, plain text, XML, JSON, but JSON is mostly used. Now look into REST API methods. What are REST API methods? For your understanding, think of REST API methods similar to SQL. Here are some most common methods. GET, POST, PUT, DELETE. GET, POST. This is very useful. For example, if you are testing a job search engine API, you can just change the city name at the end and results will be shown based on your city. PUT, with PUT, command you can update a rest api resource delete with the delete command you can delete a rest api resource or related component here is a dummy api example this api is displaying all jobs in new york for a specified company this is a api endpoint but an output could be just pass or fail the json document here is not formatted you can have different browser tools to kind of format it so it's easy to read now let's look into some API testing tools. Here are some API testing tools. Postman, Rest Assured, SOAP UI. I'm going to look into Postman and demonstrate how to perform API testing. It's open source, so it's free. You can perform manual and automation testing using Postman. It is a very powerful tool and is pretty easy to use. First, you need to download it. So we're going to go back to Google and search for download Postman. So I'm going to select the first one here. I already have Postman downloaded in my Mac. So go ahead, download it. Another thing I want to show you here, if you go to the Learning Center, they have great resources here. So if you go, if you scroll down to bottom of the screen, you will see this video intro to Postman. Watch this. This is a great video. I'm going to kind of actually go over some of the things. So now I'm going to open up Postman. So Postman, there are many features. I'm not going to update right now. So you can send a request and get a response and verify information. You can also have a collection that's basically save your request in a collection for future use, or you can share it as well. So I'm going to close it. The link I showed you guys before on my browser, this is the same link. So here I'm going to click on send. So as you can see, it actually displayed a whole bunch of information and it's kind of formatted. It's better to read. So there is an ID, full name, and uh, location is New York. That's what I passed in here. So this is the get method. So use a get method. You can just simply click here and click on get, and then plug in this URL and click on send, and this will display you this. And if I plug in some random information here, it did not display me anything. So I'm going to go back to New York, and here you can, there are a few other important things. The status is okay and displays the time and so on. So I quickly wanted to show you guys API testing and how to download Postman. Go ahead and do a little bit of practice. Go through the documentation here. Also, there are a lot of great tutorials in YouTube or other online resources about Postman. As I mentioned before, API testing is becoming very important and very famous let's put it that way and there is a huge demand for people who really understand so i'm going to stop here for a api
as I mentioned also in the SQL section and database section, I really don't want to go too in depth, you know, on these topics. I want to just kind of touch base and kind of show you guys some tools how to use them, and then, you know, you go from there. And maybe in near future, I'll create some advanced videos for these topics. What is automation testing and why automation testing? Short answer: Testing is done using an automation tool. In automation testing, tester writes script to test the software and automation tool is used to execute test cases or test suites. The automation tool can enter test data, compare expected and actual results, and generate detailed reports. To give you an example, if we go back to our ufill.com SSL issue here, as I mentioned before, site is safe. So when manual testing is done, manually someone needs to close this pop up verify all the content and make sure that these are working as expected described in the documents such as clicking on the sign up button should go to sign up page then a user should be able to create a user enter their first name last name if someone does not fill up a required field then i should display the this error message here same for here so we can with the automation tool we can insert data we can verify the required message then click on buttons think automation testing as automating all the manual work yes there are some edge cases meaning that some of the functionality might require some research and it might technology might not be there to automate it yet or it might require so much time or your team might not have that expertise so in that case manual testing Think of you are working in a project and you have about 300 test cases or regression test cases. Every time there is a deployment, your team will need to do the regression testing. Many times you will need to test after post deployment, and that's not it. You will have also have to test in Mac Safari, Mac Chrome, Mac Firefox. Again, this will be based on your requirement, right? But I'm just giving you. A very generic scenario where most of the platforms and most used browsers should be tested. And uh, Windows, you need to test it on Edge or IE, Chrome, Firefox, and then you have the mobile browsers, Android and iOS. Then you have tablets, Android tablet and iOS tablet. Think about the test cases you need to execute. So that's 300 test cases. But if you add all these platforms and the different browsers, it adds up. So now why automate or why implement automation testing? In automation testing, no manual involvement is required while executing automation test cases or test suites. Last time to execute test cases, test suites, I already kind of mentioned that. Increase overall test coverage, reduce the number of test cases to be run manually, increase test efficiency, it saves time, it saves money, it saves resources. Now we're going to install and set up Selenium, Python, and run our first script. Then I'm going to cover a few topics, such as what is the best automation tool, which programming language should you learn. So I'm going back to Google. To run our automation script, we'll need the following. We need Python 3 and up. We need Selenium client, Chrome, or any of the browser driver. For selenium then one ide you can choose any of your choice but here i'm going to use pycharm if you are familiar with eclipse or other ide you should be able to install the python plugin for it and you should be able to use it first i'm going to install selenium first step open your terminal on mac or if you are using windows search for cmd or open the command prompt first i need to make sure if i have python Install if not I'll need to install it. So to check type python dash dash version and I have 3.7.4 So if you have a previous version download the 3.74 anything above version 3 for Windows to install Python you can simply Google download Python or you can go to python.org and here click on downloads and download this version here that's 3.85 that's the latest version that's fine so i'm using mac 
so it's kind of selected for me case use is not selected by default you can switch it from here so i already have python installed so just click on download and it will download it for you then we're going to need a selenium client right easiest way to do is to go to your terminal or command prompt we're going to use a pip to install selenium so you can type pip3 install selenium so i already have selenium installed but for you you should install it if it fails for some reason just use sudo you might have some permission issues so if it's giving you permission denied just do sudo then pip3 install selenium so i already have it installed so i'm going to go to the next step so after we're done with this we need to download the browser driver so i'm going to head over to google again or chrome and this time i'm going to type download selenium browser drivers actually let me just show you the selenium site first that way you're familiar with the selenium website so selenium dot dev here you know you can read more about selenium get more information so i'm going to click on download selenium grid we're not using that so if you go you can also download the python we just installed from here so this is also a good site to kind of get familiar with why we need all these different tools languages here it kind of explains why we need the language itself in order to create scripts that interact with the selenium server remote web driver or create local selenium web driver scripts you need to make use of language specific client drivers so we already have it installed if not you can download it from here then i'm going to go to bottom of the page and click on browser there is a driver for all the major browsers so i'm going to click on chrome since i wanted to show you guys the chrome one first so here a few things here right all versions so latest version the beta version is 86 and latest latest stable release is 85 i would recommend you to use the latest stable as it mentions it's more stable but it also depends what version you have on your browser itself so to check what version you were using go to chrome about google chrome or it should be pretty much similar for all the other browsers so here you can see i have 85 so i'm going to actually close it it's checking for updates so 85 so i need to get 85 so if you have 85 if you get 86 there'll be issues so the versions need to match so some reason if you already upgraded to 86 on your browser itself then just get 86 even though it is not stable it should work so click on that and download the package specified to your os so here this is for linux mac and windows even though windows there's no package for windows 64 bit so 32 bit should work so if you have a 64 bit machine this should work so for me i need chrome driver i already have it installed but i just wanted to show it to you guys so another thing we need to do so i'm going to open up another finder when i believe i have a selenium uh, directory so I, I created one directory if you don't have it just for windows it's just a folder create a new folder named selenium or anything you name it it's good to have it in one location so it'll be easy to find so i have my chrome driver here so what do you just what i just downloaded so chrome driver here you can just drag it you know move it from this folder to that folder so now i'm going to move into the next step so now we have our python we have our selenium client and we have our browser driver now i need to install ide so to install pycharm search for download pycharm typo here pycharm okay it's right here yes close this so here are a few things it should be pre-selected by your os but if not you can select it make sure you have the right os selected for me mac is displaying here here we have few options professional version and community one professional is not free i mean they do have a free trial but eventually you will have to pay for it the community version is good enough for you so click on download so it's downloading then when it's done i'll install it so the download is completed pycharm here i have multiple actually i'm going to delete one and this one so find the file you have just downloaded and 
double click it is going to take few seconds so now for mac you can just copy it here for windows you will just uh, follow the next step also double click to just open it here it is it's coming up close all this yes open just a warning close this i'm going to go with the default previous version it's basically asking you which folder you want it to have it so okay so while this is downloading we need another thing last thing so so let me walk you through quickly how selenium works right if i go back to ufill.com so if i want to close this pop-up i simply click on the close button it closes it right but selenium doesn't know what we have in our site right? selenium is kind of like dummy right you have to tell selenium what to do so how would selenium know that okay we have this element in our page there's so many things here right so we kind of need to specify some action to tell selenium okay do this for us so this is all these objects here or the functions here they're known as web elements so if you go right click and go to inspect or windows i think there's a shortcut f11 or f12 you click and they should bring up there are other ways to go there too so here to find a specific element right so it's written the page is written in html click on this left arrow icon and now we can select and get more information about the any elements you want to so here after selecting so we just if you hover over here it kind of selects here as well or if you go here it kind of selects the elements here so here it says it's a button type is a button class close so there are a whole bunch of information here right so if you go up you can extend it i'm going to close the second window here okay so if you go up here so that's the whole section here right so if you go down this is the pop-up window itself so if you click here so here this is a class right model content so you can tell selenium okay within the model content there is a close button i want to click on that so we used to actually find all this manually you had to kind of learn how to write this and figure out and go to the dom section here and kind of play around which is the parent and child and many times it used to break as well because anytime developers they change something right it breaks meaning that they probably named it differently or in a drop down they probably added some new list so the name changed so in selenium we provided okay it's a drop down list one but drop down list is one is not there right now so it used to fail we still have that issue but you know there are better way to handle this now so one of the tool is called renorex Celosity, if i'm saying correctly so it's a chrome extension it will do all the hard work for us so you can so we'll actually install that plugin so go to click here on this ellipsis here and then go to more tools and then extensions click on this uh three lines here hamburger menu and go all the way at the bottom where it says open chrome web store click on it and then this will take you to this page here so here search for this uh, specific extension it's called r-a-n-o-r-e-x right here for me it's already added so for you there should be some kind of option saying add or something like this so just click on it and it should work so mine is right here as you can see so it will uh, just refresh the page or close the browser itself and then it should uh, be there so we have that as well so we have everything we needed right so i'm going to go to my pie charm now let me bring up my pie charm here we're going to create a new project okay so click on new project just name it anything and say so here as you can see this is just the location right so you can change it as well so i'm going to leave it i'm going to name it selenium python tutorial I'm going to keep it most of the stuff as default i have 3.7 so if you have multiple you can select it make sure you select something three and up and uh, you can select this too i mean it should be already selected for you by default and then uh, click on create it's going to take a few seconds then 
they will create the virtual environment for us. Now that we have our IDE working, now we need to configure it for Selenium so that it understands the Selenium commands. Selenium is basically a whole bunch of different libraries, jars, or packages, however you want to understand it. So we need to kind of add it to our project. So when we write Selenium commands, IDE doesn't throw some error saying, okay, we don't understand this. So to do that, go to File, Manage, New Project, Setting. If you're using an older version of PyCharm, it might be in a different location. I remember it having it just under File, but now they have it under New Project Settings. That's fine. So we need to go to Preferences for New Project, click on it, and uh, Python Interpreter is already selected. So as you can see, we don't have Selenium here. Also, often there is an error here if you have multiple version of Python. Sometimes it throws error, so make sure you have selected 3.7 or any version 3 and up. So here, go bottom of the page to your left and click on this plus icon. And here, type for Selenium. The first thing is Selenium. And I'm going to click here, install package. That is done. Close it and click on OK. Now we should be good to go for Selenium. Now that we have everything set up, we are ready to write our first script. First, click on the project itself. Right click, go to new and click on python packages you can name it anything i'll name it selenium test package and within the package right click again go to new and create a python file i'm going to name it chrome test now we have our python file we need another thing we need the chrome browser driver that's how chrome is going to recognize and selenium will able to manipulate the browser so do that there are several ways of doing it you can go here and click new and then click on directory i'm going to create a folder called drivers that way in future when you want to test on different browsers you can just have firefox safari edge and so on in the same directory or folder so now easiest way to bring the driver here is to go to our downloads or where you have downloaded your Chrome browser driver. I believe I also have it in my desktop, but since I'm here, I'll just copy it from here. So highlight it here, drag it to that directory or folder. Okay, it didn't let me copy it there. I'm going to try it again. And here you go so click on refactor and here is my okay so i'm going to press okay here is my chrome driver here now we are ready to write our script once again selenium is kind of dumb selenium doesn't know anything we need to give commands to selenium to do certain actions the first thing we need to do is kind of import selenium or driver packages libraries jars however you understand it to do that, simply you can do from selenium space import enter web driver enter go to next line. That's it. That's what that's the only thing we need to do to import everything from selenium. I'm going to enter again just to have some space so we can read it easily. Now we need to set the path for Chrome driver. So we have it here, right? So this is our main project path. Let's copy it. Right click here find in path double click here copy it control c click here so now we have it copied now let's initialize our chrome driver so i'm going to say driver equal to web driver dot chrome then here parentheses i'm going to do single quotation and paste in the path here so the path is up to here right this is the root directory right so we have a folder called or a directory called drivers so go here slash drivers within drivers we have chrome drivers so just select it press enter i'm going to save it so if you are on windows you will need to add exe dot exe and that should do it but for mac you don't need to worry about anything else so here we have taken care of that 
now we are ready to call the browser to open the browser we can use a command called get so driver.get here we plug in the url you want to automate or test or bring up so i'm going to actually go to my youtube channel and get the url from there so that way i can so here i'm going to type qa testing made easy that's my channel name here it is going to copy the url here minimize it go here single quotation plug in the url enter save it now we're ready to run our test here you can run it few ways top of the bar you see this run uh, green icon here if you click here it will run it for you or you can just simply right click and run chrome test and here you go so it opened up chrome browser and it went to my youtube channel awesome so i'm going to close it but few things i want to improve here actually so i want to maximize the browser here as you can see it's not fully maximized other thing is you see there is a new instance of chrome browser itself so i'll quit here but i want selenium to do it so to maximize the window you can use this following command driver dot maximize window that will do it for us to close our browser driver dot close so using the close command it will close only the current tab if you want to close all the tabs you can use quit so i'm going to save it this i'm going to run it from here and see how it goes and here you go so it maximized and closed the browser tab isn't that awesome so now that we have our first automation script we're able to run now i want you guys to get familiar with the renorex web element so now that's pretty straightforward right we're able to maximize open the url let's say if i want to click here about tab right how do i do it so i'm in i'm within my channel or let's say if you're in a web page and now you want to click on different tabs and verify certain things right so how can i click here so we can actually use renorex which we installed earlier so right click here go to selector actions and i'm going to copy css i like css class is a good one to link text is good my last resort is expat because expat is kind of easy to break right so i'm going to go here to my pycharm and i'm going to driver dot so now we can use the option called find element so ours is css right css selector the first one then quotation then i can just plug in what i copied from there then i want to do certain actions i want to actually click so you can do dot click so i'm not going to close the browser this time so i want to see if actually if it clicked on it i mean there are other ways to do it we can verify but just for our scenario here so if you just put a pound sign or hash sign before the line it will not execute so basically you're commenting out so now i'm going to click again and run it so as you can see it went to my page and then clicked on about right this is awesome so now and it did not close the tab this time so i'm going to go back here i also want to show you how can you manually find the same thing that renorex is doing so just for your understanding so if i go here and if i click right click and go to inspect and select the arrow here i'm going to make it smaller and then click on this particular tab here about so as you can see this is highlighted for me so this is under this div class tab content and here's the full description so you can actually copy this instead of using the css whole bunch of stuff you can do with selenium you can pretty much automate all sort of browser actions here is a good resource i want to give it to you guys selenium python dot read the doc and this site is really awesome it's pretty simple and easy to use it actually walks you through everything we did for example how to set up 
what I really like about this site is the way they put it. It's simple and easy to understand. So if you go to navigations, good examples of, you know, how can you find different elements by ID, name, expat, and with examples. So if I go back, also covers advanced topics like weights, different weights you can use, explicit and implicit weights, and also goes over page object model. That's more of like managing your test. Let's say right now you just have few things, you're doing few actions, but let's say if you have 30, 40, 100 test cases, then you need a organized way of doing things. So page object model is one of the popular one out there. So go over this. I'm not going to go in depth on automation. Again, as I mentioned for SQL and API testing and Linux, my goal is to kind of walk you through, get you comfortable with the basics and you can go from there. So now I'm going to cover a few things. What is the best automation tool? This is another confusing or most asked question out there. So I'm going to Google what are the best web automation tools. Here you can already see there are so many options here. I'm going to click on this one. Go to 99 also have good resources for learning. So here I even don't know what is a K lock and test project. Renrex is gaining popularity now and see what is if we even find selenium here. Wow, selenium is number 12, right? So selenium is open source. Many of the many of the tools you see there, uh, they might not be open source. And uh, so you need to select a tool. When you're selecting a tool for your project, most important thing is to make sure that what is in scope, meaning what kind of do you need it for just browser testing do you need also for mobile apps or mobile browsers i would definitely say look into selenium there are other frameworks such as uh, sahi water or with it and then nightwatch.js actually i have used all of them so they have their advantages right so selenium is open source it has a huge community of support right if you want to learn it you have question you can google it there are so many tutorials in youtube also in udemy so for a starter i would definitely recommend going with selenium because it's really mature it's been there for forever yeah there might be newer tools coming in the market but for a beginner you might have a hard time finding resources uh, so it'll be difficult for you to learn so Selenium already has that community of people and has been used for such a long time. Selenium is a very good choice. Now comes to what kind of programming language you should learn. So I'm going back to Google again. Best programming language to learn in 2020. So the first link here, simply learn Python is number one. And if you go down the list, Java is second, JavaScript swift and so on right so here actually i never seen this uh, comparison but uh, this is pretty awesome actually and actually i have looked at uh, simply learned some of the tutorial before they're really good and detail oriented so here i would say this is a very good resource look into this website and there are many other sites kind of compares which language of course java is the most used you know it's been there for forever and most of the applications are built on java but i really like python and that's one of the reason actually i chose to make this tutorial using python and selenium my experience is also in uh, selenium and java so i'm actually familiar with java and selenium i have also used ruby as well and javascript so i would definitely recommend learning anything with python because python is just not for automa automating the web stuff but if you even look at manufacturing you know anything robotics all using python you know data analytics all are using python and uh here you go that that might that might motivate you to also learn python so for a beginner of course you're not going to get the salary but if you were trying to get into qa this is a good start if you start learning python you grow as you learn Another thing I really like about Python, if you compare with Java, Python is much easier to learn. So if you are new to programming languages, definitely go with Python or something like JavaScript. But Python, I would recommend Python and uh, it's really gaining popularity.